Warning. The following podcast contains graphic content that may be disturbing or triggering to some listeners. Discretion is advised. The Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast is available free of charge thanks to the support of Cracked Armor. Their mission is to raise awareness for PTSD, TBI, and mental health to support those who struggle. By creating an army of warriors who represent the gear, their hope is that it will send a message to others that they are not alone. Go to crackedarmor.com. Say hi to Mark Long, read about the story, and find some research information about PTSD. And if you can, look good while supporting Cracked Armor by buying some gear. Ten nine. Did you say Papa Tango Sierra Delta? There's so much left to do, so many things I want to see and I see. Don't make the change. If it rains every single day, I'll fight to blow it all away. This is episode 27 of the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast. My name is Larry Payton and I have been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress. I'm going to give you an additional warning here now. I'm going to be talking about some things that can be very activating, triggering, bring back bad memories, listen to things that you haven't seen in a while or you've never seen in your life. Uh, It's going to get a little bit gory in the details. So if you feel that's going to be any issue, I recommend that you just skip this intro and go right to the episode. The date was October 27 in 2014. My wife and my daughters and I were visiting my brother who lives in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It's my brother's birthday, so my mother also flew in there from Newfoundland. That night, we went to an NFL game. The New Orleans Saints were playing the Green Bay Packers in New Orleans. It was a fantastic game, had a lot of fun. After the game, on the drive home, it was probably around midnight Drove the interstate and then hopped off on a secondary highway, Highway 30, which would take us into Baton Rouge. About halfway or more towards Baton Rouge, I saw what appeared to be a huge mass of fog. Very dense. As I got a little bit closer, I noticed that there was a vehicle stopped in front of me. When I stopped behind the vehicle, that's when I saw what was a collision. It would have occurred seconds before I had seen that aforementioned fog. The collision happened on Highway 30 at a small bridge just over a brook. However, because of that bridge, the accident couldn't have been avoided by those who were driving a small four-door car. The other vehicle involved was a big pickup truck, fairly heavy-duty pickup truck. I got out of the rented minivan, told everyone to stay put. Uh, My brother insisted he come out, and as I recall, I yelled at him and told him to stay the fuck in the vehicle because once you see these things, you can never unsee them. As I came up alongside the four-door car, I just saw the driver slumped over the steering wheel. I saw the passenger immediately behind the driver, slumped over, head behind the seat of the driver. As I came around the vehicle... There was one person lying on the ground at the front passenger side. There was another individual who was climbing out of the vehicle with their hands. Feet weren't being used. And then they just slumped on top of the other person who was already lying on the road. And at the back quarter panel slash tire on the passenger side of that vehicle was a young boy who was about 12. Standing around the car were four or five witnesses. And they were just in shock. They were completely comatose, just in shock. The boy came up to me and said, can you please help me, sir? Can you please help me? Which, of course, I wanted to. The boy asked if he was going to be okay. The most polite young man I've ever met. And he kept just asking, am I going to be okay, sir? Am I going to be okay? Do I just need stitches, sir? Is that that all I need? Am I going to be okay? I looked at him and I said, 
yeah, you're going to be fine. You're going to be okay. There's nothing to worry about. You're going to be fine. And he said, thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh my God. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. You're sure I'm going to be okay though. Am I going to be okay, sir? Are you sure? Meanwhile, that boy had about half of his face hanging off of his head. It had been torn from the skull right down his left side. He was in rough shape. And despite his shape, still so very polite. I started trying to tend to the boy when I asked the witnesses to make sure that they called 911. One individual said they'd already called. I asked if people could tell me what happened, if anyone had seen it. There's an individual semi-driver who said that he was behind the pickup truck for a little while. And he saw the pickup truck several times swerve across the center line into the other lane. He believed that driver was under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And he called it in. He called the police and he continued following that vehicle. Just hoping nothing would happen. Well, coming the other way was a car of several people, most of whom were younger. And they met that truck on that small bridge over that small brook. And when that truck swerved over, that car had nowhere to go. Taking the ditch wasn't an option. They were hooped when the truck slammed them. The truck really didn't have that much damage to it, minor. And the guy got out of the truck as I was tending to the kid. And he told me he was taken over the scene that he was first aid trained. And it became very apparent to me that he was intoxicated. I could smell booze off him. Needless to say, I snapped. I yelled at him and told him to get the fuck back in the truck right now. At which point he said he's first aid trained and he can help. And I said, get the fuck back in the truck right fucking now. I turned around and went back and sat in the truck. I continued tending to the kid. And he continued asking me if he was going to be okay. There really wasn't a whole lot I could do for him. He was conscious. He was breathing. He started to get a little weak and wanted to sit down. I, at that point, held him. I just didn't want him to get into a position where he was going to pass out and things could become troublesome. What seemed like forever, as it always does, finally an ambulance and police car showed up. I had taken control of the scene and I'd spoken to the police officer that attended, let him know everything I had done and that I believed that the driver of the pickup truck was intoxicated. He asked how I knew. I said I'd spoken to him in close proximity and I could detect the odor of alcohol also slurring his speech a little bit, was unsteady on his feet. A fucking piece of shit was drunk. They're fucking driving. The last thing I remember is they had that child on a stretcher and were pulling away from the scene. And a police officer had gone over, gotten the driver out of the pickup truck. There were no bracelets on the driver, no handcuffs. And he was put in the back of the police car. I learned that the driver was a firefighter a white firefighter, and that car full of people, they were all African-American. I was fucking so angry. I posted on Facebook when I got back to my brother's house, and in fairness, I pretty much had a fucking meltdown. I was fucking losing my shit. I didn't want anyone in the minivan to talk to me. There was a vehicle that came a little close as we got back on the interstate, at which point my window was down. I was slamming on the horn, fucking yelling at him. Road rage galore. And ultimately, I was fucking so triggered at that point. I had no idea I was dealing with post-traumatic stress in that stage of my career. Certainly well before I was ever diagnosed. Six years before I was diagnosed. I posted on Facebook. While driving home from the NFL game, I was thrust straight back into reality as I happened upon a violent collision which occurred just seconds before my arrival. I was one of the first on scene. Two individuals remaining inside the car appeared deceased. Alongside the car, a young male fell out to lay on the ground by a young female. Both appeared badly injured. The worst was a 12-year-old boy in shock who had asked me to help him. He wanted to know if he just needed stitches in his face and if he was going to be okay. Without details, it is needless to say that he would be needing much, much more than stitches. I stayed with the boy, trying to keep him steady. 
he kept asking me, Am I going to die, sir? Other family members on scene were screaming. It was honestly horrific. In the truck, which struck the car head on, was a lone male without so much as a scratch on him, completely and utterly impaired by alcohol. Time for a gut check, people. If you drink and drive, you are utter shit. Do the world a favor. I'll let you figure out how. I'm sharing this today because one of the things that fucking kills me is that I have no idea whatever happened to that family, whatever happened to that child, whatever happened to the driver in the pickup truck. About a year later, I called down there to the police jurisdiction. Again, advised them who I was, that I was a police officer, gave them my reg number, gave them the information about my employer, told them about the accident scene and the date and that I was looking to speak with the investigator and or get some sort of follow-up because I couldn't find anything online. I was told politely to mind my own fucking business. Huh. I and mean, that leaves a lot of things to be desired. It leaves a lot of thoughts in my head about a number of things. What fucking kills me is that it leaves that door completely open. And I think about that boy quite frequently. And I sometimes have dreams about him. I wonder if he survived. I wonder how he appears after his face was repaired. I wonder if he was alone now. That he had no family. That he had to go live with someone else. A grandparent. A different member of the family. Or even worse, sent to some sort of an orphanage. I think about whether or not through school he's been bullied. He's been made fun of. He's been harassed because he looks different because of that accident. I just don't know. And it remains completely open. It's just not closed. And it probably never will fucking close. Huh. As I'm saying this, I can actually feel my jaw trembling. That's one of my memories. That's one of my things that I can't deal with, that I can't process, that I can't get by because I can still hear him say, am I going to be okay, sir? Do you think I just need stitches, sir? You think I'm going to be okay? Thank you, sir. Oh, I appreciate you, sir. Thank God. Thank you, sir. I just wish I could find out whatever happened to him. Let's take a quick break. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. If you have experience with post-traumatic stress and would like to join me for an episode, please reach out to me. You can contact me via direct message on Instagram, PTSD underscore podcast, or you can send me an email at Papa Tango Sierra Delta Podcast at gmail.com. Cheers. We are back from the break. Thanks for sticking around for the Papa Tango Sierra Delta Podcast. I'd like to introduce Marine Corps retired Staff Sergeant Chris Whittemore. Currently lives in Texas. Chris, well, he has been in the shit. Chris has done deployments in Ramadi and Fallujah in Iraq and in Helmand Province in Afghanistan. He returned home with some post-traumatic stress, no doubt, and has since written a book called Terror to Triumph, which is fantastic. Chris, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's an it's a honor, uh, honor to be here. I'm looking forward to talking to you about this one because your journey is quite amazing as detailed in the book. But for those who have not read it and I mean, we're going to, we're likely going to get him to read it after this, Chris. I mean, let's be honest. If you can, please introduce yourself and tell us about your journey. You know, like you said, uh, my name is Chris Whittemore. I ended up doing uh, just under uh, 18 years in the Marine Corps before I got medically retired out of the Marines. But the journey kind of is a, um, is a wild one. You know, I grew up in Northern California in a small town called Paradise, California. Um, it was kind of famous or not famous in a good way. It was um, a few years back. It is the town that that fire raged through and basically burnt the city down to the ground. Uh, they're slowly rebuilding, but uh, basically all the childhood memories uh, turned to ash. 
the whole city was engulfed and burned through in just under, um, I think it's just under three hours. Holy shit. The uh, city burned, I don't know, maybe three years ago. You know, lost a lot of childhood memories, uh, a few friends, but, you know, thankfully the majority of my family was able to get out before the the fire completely gutted the town. So that was a huge plus. Uh, they've, they've made a lot of movies um, and books about the Paradise California fires. Um, the majority of my family was all in the military, uh, from my grandfather who served in the Navy in Hawaii during the Pearl Harbor bombings. Uh, he was in the north east corner of the island so he wasn't actually in the the navy yards you know down on the ships or anything like that but he ended up receiving a silver star for his time in pearl harbor wow my father and my his oldest brother or my uncle uh they served in the navy during vietnam um, off uh, on some of the ships there and my final uncle who was the youngest uh was an army uh paratrooper in uh in vietnam as well and i wanted to completely flip the script you know he went away from the navy lineage and i went completely away from the army and navy lineage (laughs) and uh joined the marine corps in the 90s when you know things were pretty uh pretty easy you know uh, uh joined in 95 and served to 99 left the the marine corps in august of 99 um after doing a couple deployments and um, ended up becoming a moving to Texas with my wife, who we're currently just surpassed our 24 year wedding anniversary. So Congratulations. That was pretty, yeah, congrats. Pretty exciting that she's uh, stayed with me through this whole time. I uh, became a Texas State Trooper in 2003, during which time I responded to countless uh, fatality accidents, uh, especially around the holidays. Um, you know, that was always the worst part. You know, going up to a door at, you know, 10 o'clock at night, uh, the day before, uh, you know, on Christmas Eve, you know, there's not many reasons why a cop is going to show up um, to your door. But, you know, having to do the death notifications and things like that um, really produced a lot of hang ups around the holidays, even before getting back into the, the military. You know, it was just one of those things where I was not just didn't want to celebrate. You know, I always had it, um, a hard time celebrating especially after delivering the news to a family that they're never going to see a loved one again. Who knew that that was going to carry on with me into um, back into the Marines? Uh, But it definitely, you know, definitely did. So after dealing with all the death notifications, the constant um, accidents, you know, arresting people and having them be out back on the street doing the same thing faster than it took me to do the paperwork to put them in jail, you know, I really had enough. Um, and wanted to uh, get back into the Marines. And, you know, I would just always felt I was a better Marine than I was a civilian, for lack of better terms. But, um, yeah, so I went down to the recruiting office, made the wonderful decision to tell the recruiter, I don't care what job you give me, <laughs> what duty station you assign me to, yeah. I just want back in. The recruiter probably thought he just won the lottery, and he was just like, ah, um, because I was, you know, a Marine already and it was, um, I was just coming back in. He said, well, you know how to do the paperwork. So here's the computer and go ahead and type up all this information. So I actually did all the paperwork to get myself back into the military. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and, uh, drove myself to MEPS. Uh, the recruiter didn't do anything. He was just kind of the facilitator of the, uh, of the documents per se. And, uh, yeah, in June, um, Or in May, I guess, of 2004, I was back in the ranks of the the Marine Corps, and they gave me my orders and said, congratulations, you and your wife are going to 29 Palms, California. Well, the first logical question was, where the hell is 29 Palms, California? (laughs) Exactly. Um, And um, the recruiter kind of pointed to a map somewhere in the middle of the Mojave Desert and said, it's uh, right about there. And he said, you're due to check in um, June, in June, so uh, best of luck. So um, my wife and I jumped in our vehicle, uh, made the long drive out to 29 Palms, and I would join up with 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. And upon their return, uh, they were still actually forward deployed to um, Iraq up in al Qaim still, or Al-Assad area. And they would be back in September, which was great because it would give me a little bit of time to acclimate, if you even can, to uh, the desert life. 
yeah, that's kind of where the journey began for that piece of it. Once there and once the unit was back, you know, we were doing a lot of training, but I had already been in the infantry my first four years, so I didn't really want to stay basic infantry. You know, I'm like, I've already done this. You know, I, I, I don't need to do it again. Um, and I'm not getting any younger, so I want to take, you know, as many chances as I possibly can to uh, do everything that I possibly could dream of doing. So um, as luck would have it, about six, bleh, five months before the it was time to redeploy, uh, the scout sniper team had an opening and they were asking for volunteers to come do the indoc. And so like a knucklehead that I was, I was like, yep, that's for me. <laughs> so I went and uh, took the indoc to be a scout sniper, uh, was selected to be part of the teams and joined the teams not long before we actually deployed into Iraq the first time in 2005. The day finally arrived, and it was time to go to Ramadi, Iraq in 2005, which um, was an absolute nightmare of a deployment. I think, hands down, that's probably the worst deployment that I was ever on uh, during my time in the military because it, it was exactly what you picture um, a war zone being. Um, it was definitely not, you know, the Call of Duty video game like so many people uh, envision. Right, yeah. Uh, during that time, Ramadi, Iraq had no elected officials. It was completely the Wild West. It was a blacklisted city where low-flying aircraft could not be any lower than 1,500 feet in a static position. So if they were flying through the city, dropping their ordnance and leaving, then they could come down low. But otherwise, they had to stay at 1,500 feet. Ramadi, it was, all, it was during the, uh, the holidays. We, passed, we got there in September, and we weren't going to leave until... Um, end of March, beginning of April. So I got to go through all of the holidays, my wedding anniversary, Jesus. my wife's birthday, um, all that stuff was going to be spent over there. Um, the uh, In the book that I wrote, uh, so hopefully a lot of people will pick it up. Um, there was uh, literally, we were in Ramadi, Iraq for not even a week yet. We haven't even fully transitioned uh, with the outgoing unit, and we took our first um, first fatality um, on our way, uh, walking to the chow hall to get some um, something to eat. Um, and we had a in, uh, a rocket attack come in and land right next to the smoking pit where people were um, hanging out and you know just smoking and getting you know smoking and laughing and trying to crack jokes. Um, and so that ended up killing uh, three and wounding eight. Um, right from the jump. So that was only a weekend. Wow. Um, Ramadi was a very um, difficult place for me. Um, there was a lot of, um, we ended up losing a total of 24 um, Marines, EOD, sailors, um, and uh, wounding, like, I think, 50 or something, at least 50 people were wounded. Um, we saw countless chaos, death, carnage, um, IEDs going off, the explosives, you know, landmines and stuff like that going off, daily indirect fire, you know, incoming sirens going off. Um, it was exactly what, you know, you would envision war being like um, if, if, you know, in the movies. And it was, it was you know, we had um, an attack helicopter get shot down um, in, in the city. Uh, we had a um, a young child that we took over their house for a few missions that uh, a young eight-year-old child was uh, was killed due to the fact that we were there by the um, by the enemy. Uh, they drug her out in the street and used her as an example. Wow. Um, we uh, so it was absolute chaos, and then all these you know uh, people getting hurt, injured, killed, all this other stuff was all occurring around the holidays, which is I really didn't think about it at the time, but coming back, you know, coming back from Ramadi, Iraq, after going through all of that, and then thinking about all the, all the death notifications that I did as a state trooper, really came full circle for me and really kind of hit me, um, hit me really hard. Um, you know, once I got back um, in March, um, I was very uh, disconnected. Um, my wife often says, I appeared to have like, the light in my eye was completely out at this point. I was just kind of a skeleton of myself. 
Um, I was definitely not able to drive down the road, see an object in the road, and not white knuckle and swerve because I, I just envisioned it being a, um, I, an IED, just like what I had seen in Iraq. Um, I wasn't able to sleep without constantly um, drinking myself to sleep because I was not able to, to shut my mind off. Um, I, had, I, knew, I knew now that I clearly had PTSD, but at the time, you know, I was just thinking, hey, I just got back from seven months. Um, you know, drinking is just part of it. I don't need to, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. This is just natural, which looking back is absolutely absurd. It's not natural to, to be like that. And it certainly feels like yeah. it's natural. I mean, it just feels, I know, you know, obviously I, I, I haven't been deployed. I've served here, but when you see enough shit, drinking just shuts it off. And that's a, that's just a good place to be. And so that's the natural side of it. I think, am I right? Do you feel the same way? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, uh, me and uh, a bunch of friends would get together on the weekends. We would, um, you know, have uh, a couple of 30 packs. We'd play John Madden football. We'd wake my wife up at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning and tell her, you know, hey, we need you to go to the store and get another, you know, bottle of alcohol, you know, whiskey yep. or yep. something or more, more beer. Yep. Um, and, you know, reluctantly she would do that. Um, she would, um, you know, I, I definitely put her through, you know, hell on, you know, after that first deployment. Um, but thankfully, you know, she knew like if she didn't get up and go, uh, I would have done it. And then, you know, God forbid, could have got a DWI, could have killed somebody, could have hurt somebody. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the close members uh, that had joined the, um, the sniper team, but ended up going back to his regular platoon. Uh, before that deployment to Ramadi, Iraq, uh, the night we were back um, in 29 Palms, uh, which added to the problems that I was having, I think, he was staying out in town with his family, had just went to the liquor store and purchased a bunch of alcohol, was running back across the street, uh, back to the hotel with his family, and was struck by a, uh, a drunk driver and was paralyzed from the neck down, and he ended up just passing away about... Uh, I don't know, five years ago now, I think, but he basically, from the date we got back in 2006 to now, he basically lived out his life paralyzed uh, due to, um, you know, it, it was just that type of environment that we were all engulfed in during that time. I mean, just things, it just never stopped. You know, you never had a sense of peace, uh, even being back in the States. And um, Chris, I'm going to just read. For people to hear from the book, and I just want to hold on a second, I just want to read this so people can understand what you just said. So here's from the book. Disaster has a way of showing up right away, and our company was no exception. In fact, the night that we got home, our company was hit with the worst news yet. One of the Marines that was with Cat Blue, who was staying out in town with his family, ran across the main road from purchasing alcohol and was struck by a car. He was paralyzed from the chest down and lived out his life in bed. Just recently, I found out that he passed away. How could someone survive what we just did, be back in the States less than 24 hours, and then have to deal with this? This regretfully was not going to be the only loss that our company and battalion would face during our initial reacclimation back to the States, but was definitely the most gut-wrenching. This also had the unique ability to drive home the mindset, and this is I, I, this just resonates the fuck out of me, Chris. This also had the unique ability to drive home the mindset that nowhere is safe. Not even being back home in the States was going to keep us away from the danger. I mean, that is very deep. It gives an insight as to the reality that you feel you have escaped the danger and there is no reason anymore to be hypervigilant only within 24 hours for that to be thrown up into the trash, essentially that whole mindset. Yes, absolutely. And, and because of that, that basically, I carried that with me all the way through, uh, you know, being back home. Um, I, I just isolated away. I kept my, my wife and I isolated away. I didn't want to do anything, be around anybody. Um, I would go to work, put on this fake persona that everything was okay. I would get home, completely crash, drink myself to sleep. And it was rinse and repeat. And that was my, uh, my whole existence and 
looking back, it, it was absolutely gut wrenching that I even allowed myself or my wife for that matter, who has stayed with me for this whole entire time um, through that whole process. You know, I mean, it was, it was just, it was a nightmare. Um, you know, shortly after um, all these incidents, we also got word that the unit that relieved us in Ramadi within three weeks had become combat ineffective, which basically means they've lost so many people that they would not be able to sustain that deployment without getting reinforcements. So here we are just only back, um, I don't know, maybe a month, month and a half. And now they're, they're asking for volunteers for people to go back to help that unit that just, you know, lost so many people. Jesus. Um, I was really contemplating raising my hand and wanting to go back, which is kind of crazy to me, you know, that I would want to actually go back to, you know, this war zone. But I knew that being here in the States, I was, I was miserable. I was unhappy. I was con constantly drunk. My wife had to be like, what is going on? But I, I didn't have any understanding of what was happening to me. I just figured it was, hey, I just went through war zone. I could do whatever I want, um, you know, and, you know, screw the society rules. But after, um, I don't know, March, April, May, June, um, you know, right in June. So we're not even back 90 days yet. And I finally talked to my wife. I said, I've got to go back to Iraq. I've got to get out of here. I'm not happy. I'm miserable. You know, I want to right the wrong. This this stuff is, is driving me crazy. Uh, she completely understood, uh, or at least she said she understood. I don't think she really no. you know, <laughs> approved of it whatsoever. No. But um, I immediately made the, uh, the hop over to um, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, and they were deploying back to Fallujah, Iraq in January of the next year. So I wasn't even going to be home a full year, and I was going to be back in Iraq. Um, Returning, you know, back to Iraq was really like a deja vu moment. Um, I kind of touch on it in the book where it's like, you know, I'm back in the plane. I'm walking down the steps to the Iraqi buses, and I literally felt like I had just got off the buses and walked up the stairs under the plane to go home, um, you know, which it had only been a year, but it's kind of like a – it was just really creepy. I mean, I almost could envision myself walking – back up those stairs, like in Back to the Future, when yeah, you know Michael yeah, yeah. J. Fox saw himself again. It almost felt like that, wow. where I was like watching myself walk in the opposite direction at the same time. It was really creepy. During that deployment, um, I served as in a different role, you know, as a sniper as well, but I was also in charge of the armory, the weapons, things like that. The first deployment was nice and cold. Uh, and rainy through the holidays. This time it was going to be extremely blistering hot. Um, you know, the desert sandstorms, 130 degrees outside during the day. Um, it might cool off to 95 degrees by midnight, one o'clock in the morning. By, um, you know, six in the morning, the heat's already on the rise back up. So there was no relief uh, from the heat whatsoever. And we're going to be there from January to August. So we're going to go right through the hottest and most miserable part of the, the year. You know, we did the deployment. We lost a lot of people. Um, you know, a few of our uh, platoon commanders, officers uh, would fall uh, during this deployment. There was a few good things. You know, I was ended up running into some people that I used to serve with uh, back in the 90s when I was first in, which was really exciting to see that they were still in the Marines and they were doing really good. Um, so that was great to see them. I got promoted, but as I was progressing through this deployment, I had a really strong realization that my time in my first four years, it was up. So it was time to make that decision to get out again and get away from the military altogether or, you know, stay in the military uh, like what I promised my wife when we first rejoined in 04 we made the promise to ourselves that if I rejoined, I was going to stay until they kicked me out. So um, I, did, I had to make the decision, you know, was, are these de two deployments enough? And do I need to get out and try and find my way back to who I was? Or am I going to stay in and stay with the infantry? Or am I going to change jobs and do something different? Well, like, you know, like I said in the beginning, if 
I'm not getting any younger. And if I was going to do all these different things that, you know, I really wanted to do now would be the time. So I ended up re-enlisting to be a crew chief helicopter door gunner on the new Huey helicopters. And off I went, I re-enlisted. We returned home. During this deployment, my wife's grandfather that she was super close to was pretty much like a father to her, had passed away. Uh, She was on her own in 29 Palms, California. Uh, So she ended up moving back to Houston during the deployment. And so she came back out to see me, you know, being back home. um, And I was going to basically check out of the unit, check into the new training squadron in Camp Pendleton, California. And she would stay in Houston until we received our, you know, permanent new orders to a, you know, where we're going to be assigned, you know, then she would move back out and we'd go from there. Well, I left that unit. She went back to Houston and I was basically all alone, stewing in my thoughts, drinking every night. But now being at Camp Pendleton, I was back in the barracks, just like I was a single Marine. I had no real leash. I was kind of like running free, running amok and doing whatever I kind of wanted to do. And I didn't care about the consequences. Didn't I had a motorcycle now. I was riding up and down the beach, drinking every night, doing just dumb things that looking back, I'm just like, what was I thinking? But I, I just, I didn't care. You know, I had just survived two deployments. I've, you know, lost tons of people that I were real close to society rules and everything like that was, was not going to be a problem for me. So yeah, it, it was just really bad. A few months into that nonsense, my wife called me up and said, I'm going to come back out there. You're going to get us a house. We're going to fix whatever is going on with you. And you know, that's going to be that. I was excited that she was coming back, but I also knew that I was no longer going to be able to put up that fake mask or that persona because now someone was coming out here that knew full well what I had been through and I couldn't hide it anymore. Once she came back out, we were doing a lot of work on ourselves, but she also wanted me to get help. She wanted me to go see the mental health provider. She wanted me to, you know, not become a statistic because, uh, you know, as we all know, during that time, there was about 22 people a day killing themselves or, you know, doing something else that would basically take themselves out of the equation. And she didn't want me to be that statistic. You know, I didn't view it as being a statistic. I just viewed it as, you know, whatever's going to happen to me is going to happen. And, you know, whatever's going to happen, we're just going to see what happens from there. Thankfully, she arrived in time. Uh, She told me that she would go with me to talk to a therapist out in town because I was not going to go on base. There was no way I was going to be that guy who was going to ask for help because at that time, and even currently, you know, there is a stigma where if you're the problem, you know, there's no time to be the problem. You're, if you're the problem, you're going to go away and the rest of the people are going to train, deploy and go from there. My great way of thinking is, Hey, I'm going to go out and, meet a therapist out in town, and I'm going to be able to have the best of both worlds. It's going to stay out of my military record, but I'm going to be able to receive help and, you know, go from there. So, of course, I go out in town, meet with the therapist, sit down and talk to the therapist for two hours, and he looks up from his little notepad and said, yeah, you have way too many issues for me to help you with. You're going to have to go on base. (laughs) So I immediately told my wife, F therapy, I don't care. I'm not, no, I'm done. I'm just going to work longer hours. I'm going to keep myself engaged. I will put on this fake persona and I will come home every night and just continue doing what I was doing. After trying that for another three months or so, going through, uh, you know, the training to be a mechanic on the helicopter before you can learn to fly. I was just miserable. I, I didn't, I wasn't sleeping. I was waking up hungover every day. I, I just, I couldn't keep living like that. I just couldn't. So I know what you're talking about, brother. I am beside you throughout that entire fucking process. I know it's brutal. Yeah. And, and I just, I, I couldn't keep doing that. So I finally do my wife's persistence for lack of better terms. Uh, she wasn't going to take no for an answer. So it didn't really matter, but she ended up going with me to the Navy hospital. I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, uh, major depressive disorder. You know, they immediately put me on medication. 
the problem was doing the, the maintenance of the helicopters was fine, but to be a crew chief, you also had to pass the flight physical and get cleared to do that job. So I knew, I didn't know at the time, but it was going to be a big problem coming up. I graduated from the mechanic aspect, which was was great. You know, working on aircraft was a whole lot better than running around with a heavy 80 pound pack on and, you know, shooting rifles and all that stuff. I went into the medical and I'm like, Hey, I'm here for the flight physical, you know, let's get this going. And he said, well, you were diagnosed with PTSD and you're on medication. You're not cleared to fly. So he's like, you have two choices. One, we can take the PTSD diagnosis completely out of your medical record and I'll clear you right now. Or you can leave the PTSD diagnosis, come off the medication that you just started, be off medication for a year, and then we'll be able to get you um, your flight status. Chris, that leaves you with a big choice. Yeah, that's a difficult thing to choose, man. Uh, We're going to take a quick break, Chris. And when we come back, we're going to talk about what your decision was, what happens thereafter, and get back to the book. We'll be back after the break. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a rating at your preferred podcasting service. Hey, you know what's even better than a rating? If you take a moment to actually write a review, that'd be awesome. We are back from the break. Thank you very much for sticking around to hear the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast. Currently talking with retired Marine Corps Staff Sergeant Chris Whittemore. Here's a piece from the book before we continue on that will talk about those feelings Chris had when he was home. The most unnerving reality that would surface after returning home for all of us is that no matter how many issues you have and no matter how many times you hear information about seeking help if you are having issues, no one wants to be that guy. The demon that is hiding inside everyone, pride, will take over the rational side of the brain and stop you in your tracks. Deep down, you know that something is wrong, but you insist that you are fine and can fix it the old-fashioned way drinking. You would rather self-destruct or pretend nothing is wrong as you watch your life, family, etc. being turned inside out. Chris, those are some deep words, brother. Those are some deep words. Going back and reading the book and hearing different uh, snippets of the book, I'm just like, man, where did that stuff come from? But it was really important for me to write this book to really not just talk about another war book because there's, oh my God, you can go to Barnes & Noble and probably find a hundred books on the different battles, the different wars, the different, you know, all the way back to the civil war, to present day, to all that stuff. But what there was not a lot of, or if, I don't even know if there's a book since mine, but there probably is on what happens to the service member, to the families, most importantly, what happens when we come back and we're drinking, we're isolating, you know, what happens to the families and, you know, how do they survive? And that's really what I wanted to stress with this book is, look, it's one, it is okay. My favorite line in the whole book, or, you know, every time I I talk about the book is, it is okay to not be okay. And I wish someone would have given me that simple little sentence advice back in 2006, because I think my life would be completely different now if I would have just realize that. And, you know, what I often tell people is pride will stop you in your tracks and not allow you to think, you know what, like it's okay to, you know, have issues. Because I tell people, if you can go through what we went through on these deployments or anywhere else in your life, you know, no matter what it is, it doesn't have to be combat related PTSD. But if you've gone through that and you're not having some sort of issue, then you're a psychopath and you need to turn yourself into the prison because it's natural that you're going to have a reaction. So allow yourself to have that reaction. You know, it's like, you know, the firefighters at 9-11, the firefighters and EMTs and people who survived the Oklahoma City bombing way back then. And I, I asked people, I was like, is it okay if they have issues? And the answer is always, well, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Then why is it not okay for you to have issues? Absolutely. And, and a lot of people get stuck on that because they can't answer that, you know, in a way that makes what they're doing bad. It's like, it's okay to not be okay. And I, if I cannot stress anything more to anybody, 
it, it's that one sentence. It is okay to have issues after surviving a traumatic event. It is. So allow yourself the grace to deal with that issue and better your life. Do not let what you went through and, oh, I have issues. I must be weak. Ruin the rest of your life. You know, like I did for the next eight, nine years, I let, you know, what I went through hold me under the under its thumb and beat me down. The last thing we were talking about is that doctor made me decide, hey, what are you going to do? I just re-enlisted. I wanted to fly on the helicopter. I wanted to be a door gunner. So I told him I'm not going to take the PTSD diagnosis out of my record book, but I will immediately stop taking the medication that was helping me, which what a stupid decision that was. So I stopped the medication cold, cold turkey. Wow. Told them, start the clock. In one year, I'm going to be back and I'm going to get myself cleared, which I was right back to dealing with the stuff the way I was before uh, because I was not sleeping. Now I was coming off the medication that was helping me. So I was back to my miserable self. The year was up, went through the flight physical, went through the flight training uh, to be a helicopter crew chief. And I was uh, officially graduated, uh, crew chief wings in hand a year and a half later. The remarkable thing was the squadron that I was going to be sent to was going to be such an eye-opening experience for me. Um, I had no way of really preparing myself for it. The squadron that I was going to was HMLA 369, the gunfighters, which they were famous all the way back in Vietnam as well. But what was interesting is this squadron was the helicopter squadron that supported us while we were in Ramadi, Iraq in 2005. So here I came like a full circle. I am now with the squadron that was protecting us. Now I would be protecting the other Marines and other people on the next deployment. Incredible. So it was time, May of 2010. It was back on the buses, back to the Freedom Bird to fly over onto a deployment. And we were sent to uh, Helmand Province, Afghanistan in 2010, which would be right through the middle of the summer months as well over there, which just because it was Afghanistan, it was still going to be blistering hot uh, during the day. And we were going to be on two 12-hour shifts. You were either going to work midnight to noon or noon to midnight. Of course, I was midnight to noon, and we'd be back in the tents trying to sleep at noon, which is the hardest, hottest part of the day, which never worked out too well. And these were just like the canvas GP style tents with a small little standalone air conditioning unit that would constantly freeze up um, and turn that canvas tent into an oven. So you really weren't sleeping very much, but we would end up flying so much in the first few weeks that the flight surgeon in Afghanistan lined up all the pilots and all the crew chiefs and one by one asked us, are you aware of the dangers of flying and being a crew chief outside of the normal parameters of the flight hours? And I said, yeah, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. You know, no problem. But we were actually flying in the red way outside of the FAA and the naval flight rules that govern like how many hours a pilot can fly, just like an airline, commercial airline pilot has certain hours. They can't fly any more than this many hours without rest and all that other stuff. As a squadron, we flew 9,800 or 9,700 flight hours in a seven-month period, which was way, shit. way more than what's allowed. Like, we were nowhere near where we were supposed to be. Christ, no. We were flying four to five combat missions per day in support of different units where it was so bad at times, we would be sitting on the flight line with the helicopter spinning, waiting for the QRF or the, you know, the quick reaction force alarm to go off, wiping Tabasco sauce on our eyelids. So if you close your eyes, it would burn so bad where you, you would have to open your eyes. And that was the only way that we were staying awake. We were all so exhausted, wow. but we knew the more we flew and the more we took, you know, the fight to the enemy, the safer the guys on the ground were going to be. Well, what I didn't know is the guys on the ground was going to be 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines. So the two infantry battalions that I was with were fighting on the ground beneath us while I was flying overhead. So again, it came full circle. We would fly uh, convoy escorts. We would fly direct fire QRF missions where uh, patrol was pinned down and we would fly overhead and take the fight to the enemy. We would 
uh, fly medevac escorts. So we'd escort the Army dust off and the Air Force pararescue jumpers in to get the wounded. We would fly the angel flights, which means we'd pick up, you know, the fallen and fly them back to the morgue and get them, you know, offloaded so they could be sent home to their loved ones. It was nonstop. So from May to November, we ended up taking out uh we actually made a kill board, which was kind of sick, but we actually made a kill board outside of our flight line shop um, of all the enemies that we killed. We'd spray, spray, spray paint a stencil up against this red board, and we ended up having confirmed 158 enemy fighters were taken out uh, by us during the seven-month deployment. So wow. that was maybe not something to brag about, but we even made like the shirts like with the little stencil board on the back um, yeah, of, of our yeah, shirts yeah. to really show like, yeah. um, you know, uh, it, it was just, it was kind of like carving a notch in a rifle, you know, like the guys in Vietnam did. Yep. And um, we wanted to, you know, we were proud of what we did, but, you know, looking back, it was not the enemy that we took out by no means, but it was the, you know, just the amount of flying, the, the stress, there, there was just no let up whatsoever. You were, it was 12 on 12 off seven days a week for seven months. It, it didn't matter. I mean, there was no, there was no break. You were exhausted. You weren't sleeping because of the heat. You weren't really eating. You were, you just became a zombie. About 90% of the way through that deployment, they came to me and said, Hey, congratulations. As soon as we get back, you're going on recruiting duty. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I came back. I wasn't going to get any help uh, for the PTSD. The drinking was going to be the same, but now I was going to be on recruiting duty trying to, you know, talk to people about joining the military and, you know, and I, and I love being in the Marines. I absolutely loved it, but I wasn't going to sugarcoat anything to anybody about what was going to happen or what they were going to experience. And that doesn't make a great recruiter, you know, uh, telling people about the, you know, here's the reality of it. The but truth. Being totally clear and transparent and, and being honest about it is what it is, right? Yeah, it, it's not a call of duty, you know, hit the power button and reset, get five more lives. No, right. it's not going to be like that. And anyone who would come in and say, hey, I want to be the infantry, you know, every month when those those young kids would come in, the ones who were waiting for boot camp, we'd have them come in and PT with us and, you know, do all that. I would play a deployment video and say, this is what is reality. Like, who still wants to be in the infantry? And a lot of people quickly changed their jobs. You know, they were like, uh-uh, yeah. I don't want to do that, right. which, which is good. I'm glad that they came to that realization when they did, you know. Well, that's a better time to come to that realization, Chris, is, is what it is. I mean, as opposed to being out there on the line and, you know, making yeah. those with those small insurgent teams, which you were doing as a sniper, and then finding out this isn't for somebody. That is not the appropriate time to determine that. So, you, you, you No, know, especially not deployed, you right, know, yeah. and... And tragedy struck once again for me, you know, after coming, um, going on recruiting duty, I was, you know, a month in, month or two in to recruiting duty. At my duty station, we were back in Houston, Texas, around my wife's family, you know, things were going good. The recruiting office I was with was awesome. We were all like receiving award after award. We were just on top of our game. So we put on a great show. So we were doing our job. Well, my wife calls me one night. I'm at this kid's family's house, you know, getting parental consent for him to join because he was 17 years old. And my wife calls in hysterics. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, great. You know, maybe one of her family members passed away. You know, maybe, you know, who knows what it is. Well, that wasn't the case. I, the last person that I flew, the final mission in Afghanistan with was named was Trevor Cook. He, uh, him and uh, his wife and my wife became really close friends during that deployment. And we flew a lot of missions together in Afghanistan. Well, I went on recruiting duty. He stayed flying and the helicopter he was in had a mechanical uh, issue uh, doing landings uh, in California. And the helicopter ended up crashing, rolling down a hill. He was thrown from the helicopter crushed and killed instantly. So we ended up flying back to California to attend his memorial. Uh, but that was, you know, right again, right after you got back, you knew you weren't safe on deployment. Now here you go again, you're back home and tragedy strikes again. So, you know, returning from his memorial was drinking, 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 drinking. 
and it, it was just constant. On top of that, my wife and I, um, you know, were trying to go through the fertility treatment to, you know, uh, have start a family. Um, she ended up after the third time, third treatment, she, we ended up finding out she was pregnant. And a month later, she ended up miscarrying and losing the child. So now we're dealing with the death, a miscarriage. Um, we just had to put our, um, our dog down uh, because it had cancer. And now they were sending me to a duty station five hours away from anything in a small little town called Lufkin, Texas. And I was going to take over an office that had been struggling for about four months. And I was going to you know, have to put all my own personal stuff aside and deal with this stuff, you know, deal with this stuff and not and just keep drinking, drinking myself to sleep, drinking myself to deal with the stress. Um, it was just going to be a constant beating that I was going to put myself through like a gluten for punishment that I was. And that only lasted, oh God, I don't know, about two years into recruiting duty. I finally, everything finally caught up. The the medical issues, my back, my knees, my, you know, my body was like, oh, you know, you treated me like an amusement park. Well, guess what? <laughs> now I am done. You yeah. know, uh, my body started shutting down. Uh, I wasn't able to run. My back hurt. I wasn't able to be, you know, the Marine that I, I'm used to being. I just was not able to. And through an abusive command, I finally snapped and they sent me to inpatient treatment facility for six weeks where I really had to get you know, but the medication correct. I had to go through, um, you know, PTSD counseling and I was inpatient for six weeks while I got myself, you know, straightened out during this time. And because I have such an amazing wife, she ended up writing letters to the top three commandants, our major of the Marine Corps, his wife, their wives. Uh, she wrote strong letters to them about what was going on with that recruiting command because they were really abusive. They were you know, constantly harassing the combat veterans, you know, things like that. And they were just not, um, they weren't supportive whatsoever. So about 48 hours after those letters were received by the key players, that commanding officer and that sergeant major were both on the carpet in front of the general in San Diego to answer for what in the, you know, what in the world was going on under their command and what the heck was going like what they were thinking, come to find out, and this is all secondhand, is they sent the general's team to that recruiting office, the main recruiting headquarters, to do a complete deep dive into what was going on. Uh, and after returning from that, the general told that CO, you've got two choices. You can either get busted down from, I think she was lieutenant colonel, busted down to major or I think captain, I think they were going to take two ranks away from her, or you can retire right now and never go back to a recruiting command again. And they forced retired her out of the Marine Corps, which I think saved a lot of people's lives because a lot of people were just, they weren't going to ask for help because they knew they had to go through that command. So I, I think that saved a lot of lives. Um, and she was forced retired. And the ironic thing is now she... Um, Every once in a while, I'll kind of like look in to see what everyone's doing. And she actually trains canines for wounded warriors up in Colorado. So she completely has gone full circle, wow. um, went from a, you know, a useless person to now she is, you know, training the dogs that, you know, are going to help the wounded warriors. So I, I always found that really funny. So from the inpatient, I ended up going to the Wounded Warrior Battalion where I underwent a few surgeries, more rehab, more mental health counseling, more, you know, dealing with PTSD. And that kind of led to my wife finally hitting her breaking point where she, you know, never received help for any of the stuff that I put her through, that she was going through, anything like that. And she ended up um, trying to take her life. She committed suicide. Thankfully, we got her to the hospital in time and she survived. And yeah, and now, you know, since being retired from the Marine Corps, our job or our goals are to help as many people as we can to ensure that they don't go down the same path or bumpy roads that we did. And uh, that's the journey I've been on. And, you know, since being retired in 2015, 
I am now working for the county where I live in San Antonio, helping veterans do their disability claims through the VA. Uh, my wife is a marriage and family therapist uh, and substance abuse therapist, uh, where she's helping people, you know, through their darkest of times and, you know, and of course wrote the book, Care to Triumph. And it is, um, you know, my goal that anyone who, you know, has a family member or a loved one, a friend, a, you know, uh, family members from Vietnam, what, whatever, it doesn't have to be present day, you know, pick up the book, you know, really see what is going on. And, you know, the realization that, you know, this is what these men and women are coming back from the deployments facing. This is what the families are likely facing and really kind of bridge that gap and really help and save as many people as I possibly can. And, and, you know, diminish that 22 a day. I believe, Chris, that you could even extend that to, you know, the first responders you spoke about in terms of the paramedics, firefighters, police officers, when you spoke about your initial death notifications and so on and so forth. And the reality is, to me, as I read the book, as much as it's coming from the perspective of a combat veteran who has seen some of the absolute worst, I mean, I can still resonate with what you're saying in terms of the inability to deal with the stressors, the inability to feel safe. And so what you want to do, and these are things that Chris says in the book to the listeners that he just wants to go home. He wants to isolate. He wants to drink. Yes, that has been my life for, um, it just changed over the last two or three months in terms of, this is a big one here that I like when we get into leadership Chris says in the book, for some weird reason, the people in charge had forgotten the most important part of leadership, and that was taking care of the ones who were supposed to take care of them. That certainly resonates, and I believe that resonates with a lot of first responders as well. So although the book is coming from the perspective of a combat veteran, which certainly is going to give a significant amount of information to families and friends of those who serve in the military, there's a lot in this that comes out for anyone who serves and has their life on the line. Chris, the book is, the book is great. It's very enjoyable. And you speak a great deal with regards to the post-traumatic stress, which I appreciate it personally. The only other book that I've read where a Marine actually speaks somewhat about post-traumatic stress was With the Old Breed by Eugene Sledge or Sledgehammer, who was in the Pacific in the Second World War. And Sledge only gets into it a little bit. Of course, it's a different time, but he just talks about the inability to be able to hunt again and that he breaks down and he cries and he doesn't understand what's happening. I mean, that's it right there. It's yeah. the world has changed for him as it did for you. Chris, what advice would you give those returning from deployments or, or those that are struggling with the fact that they're living in the shit within their own country? Yeah. And that's a great point too. You know, it, it's not just here in the States and, you know, with, with the book, one of the guys that I met in 2007, he ended up touching base with me and we served together in the nineties. And then again, in 2007, and I hadn't seen him in or talked to him since 2007. And here it is in 2022, he reached out to me. He's like, God, he's like, you know, I picked up your book and because I wanted to unload my own stuff, like, hey, Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, I was there too during different times. But he read the book, you know, it really sunk in with him. And him and his family, his kids had been estranged for 15 plus years. Like they just didn't talk because dad had PTSD. He was drinking all the time. He was angry all the time. He never wanted to be around him and continued to never want to be around him. He gave them all a copy of my book they started reading the book and now not long ago, they've all started to kind of come back together as a family and rebuild that family bond. Cause now they understand what's going on. And with that being said, I think that is, that's the advice is if you know something is going on, give yourself the grace to feel what you went through. Do not bury it. Do not think you're just going to work through it or drink through it because the minute you start down that path, and believe me, because I, I was an expert at it, the minute you start going down that path, there's only going to be three solutions. You're either going to go to jail, you're going to lose your family, or you're going to lose your life. Those are your three choices. 
be good with yourself. Give yourself the grace to know that, yeah, you just went through a miserable experience. No matter, then like you said, no matter if it's firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, police, military, former, you know, military overseas, it doesn't matter. Like it's okay to process through that grief because once you process through the grief and you come out of that fog, the greatest thing ever was when I retired and I finally came out of that fog, life is so much better when you're not under the pressure and under the gun where you're putting on this fake Halloween mask every time you go outside of your door, you come home and you absolutely break down and crash. Life is miserable that way. Give yourself the opportunity to live your best life. Every day, wake up and say, you know what? Today is going to be the best day ever and get the help that you need. Get your family the help that they need. Do not run yourself into that wall. Do not become a statistic. There's too much out there. And that, you know, that one person who's struggling, they could be the one that finds the cure for cancer. They're the ones who can make the military a better place. They're the ones who can save their career. You know, don't believe just because you have PTSD that you can't still be in the military. You still can't be a cop. You still can't be an EMT. You know, work through the stuff, be a better version of yourself, and then help others. It's like that's the greatest gift that I could possibly have given myself is being able to help others and share my experiences and my do's and don'ts. And, and, you know, hopefully that allows someone to just live that much better of a life. And the reality is when you pick up the book and you start making your way through it, as I did, you know, you read first Chris's background and then all of a sudden he's in Ramadi and you're like, holy shit. The things he goes through in the book are significantly more in depth than during this conversation, but you feel like you're there with him for a lot of it and he steps on that plane and he goes home and you're like okay whoo starts going downhill and you i know chris i'm reading the book and i'm like all right well this is where he's going to hit the ptsd this is where he's going to get his shit together and you do and then all of a sudden you're going to fallujah and i'm like what the hell's going on whoa whoa chris (laughs) right whoa (laughs) and and you step off that plane and i'm like Man, you had to be thinking, what was going through my head right now? Like, holy crap, I'm back into this. I understand you felt there was unfinished business. And so for what that's worth, I felt that when we had an incident up here, that there were some uh, Ontario police officers shot, one of whom was killed. And all I wanted to do was go back to the front lines. I just wanted to go back and just, I just wanted to go back and fight. I just wanted to go back and, and be there and just because you you just have this innate sense of wanting to thwart evil and try to make the world a better place continue to serve and you really just want to take care of your brothers and sisters i say this chris because then you end up in afghanistan again i'm in the book going dear god chris oh my god you're a sucker for punishment what are you doing to yourself <laughs> right yes you come back from there and this is where, and, and this is what I like about the book as well, and I, I do need to throw this in because it doesn't go, Chris goes from Ramadi to Fallujah to Helmand and then comes back and talks about PTSD. No, he goes to Ramadi and talks about what's experienced in terms of what happens from there to Fallujah, what happens after that, and then Helmand province and what happens after that. But it all comes together where you, and this is, the, this is what I want you to speak about now, is to do de-stigmatize any sense of guilt, embarrassment, shame for feeling these things because, dear God, we are right now listening to a man who has done three deployments in some heinous areas and has no issue saying, yeah, that affects you. That leaves scars. That screwed me up. Chris, talk about the, the fact that you're stepping away from this and how you're still helping people by pulling down the walls of stigmatization. The greatest job that I could have ever found was it, the position that I'm in now where I'm actually helping veterans every day from the men and women coming in from that served in the Korean War, Vietnam War, Gulf War, there's, you know, all these wars up to today's date, you know, they come in and they're all the, they're all not all the same, but they all have that same look on their face. And, you know, it, my job here is to do, like, claims and stuff like that for them. But I often go and speak to these wounded warriors, 
at these different military units um, as a guest speaker. And I, and I, you know, I really emphasize and try and push as hard as I possibly can that, you know what, this is not the end of your journey. Do not let the stigma that everyone is afraid of, everyone's afraid of showing weakness. Everyone's afraid of, oh, if I tell them I'm, I have something wrong, I'm going to be ripped away from my family of military brothers and sisters. And that's not the case, even though that's the stigma and that's what everyone thinks, there's absolutely no reason that that is, it's not true. It, it You can do so many great things. Yeah, people may, you know, just like in any job or any school or any whatever, it doesn't make any difference. There's going to be those ones who are like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And they're going to, they're going to run their mouths. But you know what? I never believed this then, but I fully believe this now. It takes a much stronger person to admit to having issues and asking for help than to sit behind a closed door at your house, drinking yourself into oblivion or taking pills or pulling a trigger of a gun and taking yourself out of the equation. It takes a much stronger person to take that step and be vulnerable. And it's the hardest thing you're ever going to do. But the minute you become vulnerable and you start getting help and you start feeling better, well, now you're that example of those people who are hiding in the shadows. They're going to start, that light is going to start getting shown on them and they're going to start coming out of the shadows. And that is how that 22 a day begins to disappear not by doing safety briefs, not by, you know, whatever. It is by the people who are, have gone through it uh, in any job. It doesn't even matter. Just like we said, it doesn't matter what job it is. Be the light that shines into the shadows and helps those other people come out and live that better life. And that's, I think that is going to be how we're going to save more and more people and how, you know, more and more of the stigma is going to disappear and the more and more the world is going to have the ability to discuss the things that no one wants. No one wants to discuss the mental health challenges of anybody. No one wants to discuss the suicide stuff. No one wants to discuss the bad stuff, but the more and more we normalize it and discuss it, the more and more people are going to receive help. And I think that's going to be the giant shift that is needed um, because the, the struggle is still occurring now, even though, the U.S. has pulled out of Afghanistan what, a, a year and a half, almost two years ago, or a year ago, maybe. Um, you know, that suicide rate, even all the way back to the guys in Vietnam, are dropping left and right because no one wants to talk about it. No one wants to normalize it. Um, and uh, that is, I, I think, one of the reasons the book was written as well is because um, I've had friends reach out to me. It's like, I'm so glad you finally or someone finally wrote it out and really describes it in a book, you know, and I've heard all the time, oh, I really was thinking about doing that, but, you know, I just, I never wanted to sit down and do it, da, 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 da. And you know what? And I, I finally had to make myself vulnerable because all these stories that are shared in that book are very personal to me. And now the world can pick up the book and read all these stories. But the more people who read the book, the more people who share the book, the more lives that are going to be saved. And I would rather be vulnerable and have people read the stories than attend someone's funeral because they didn't get the help that they needed. Hallelujah. I am with you 100% in terms of this podcast. It is the exact same thing. I personally do not care what anyone thinks. I do not care what, I, I just don't give a shit, Chris. Ultimately, yeah. all I care about is my brothers and sisters, and I don't want them to be a statistic, just like you said earlier. I just do not want that. So whatever gets you to bed tonight and up again tomorrow morning to fight, to survive, to live, to find something to love and to love you back, that is all I care about. And if that's the podcast, that's great. If it's the book and the podcast, that's great. I don't give a shit if it's the Flintstones on TV. I could care less. Just go to bed <laughs> yep. and get up the next morning. That's all I want. Chris, what do we, and this is a very important topic that comes up frequently. Is there so many of our brothers and sisters who talk about the trauma, the secondary trauma that they've caused to their spouses? And that's something that certainly hit home with yours. I know my wife still isn't at a point where she's comfortable discussing it. 
she's been through shit as well. And I'm very happy that she stayed with me through all this because I know I was a drunk and I was an asshole. What is it you would say to people out there in terms of how they need to take into account what's going on at home and the fact that, uh, that this is tough on their husband or their wife? Yeah, um, I think what I would say about that is most certainly, you know, everything that um, individual has gone through is very traumatic, but don't think for one second that the stuff that you've been through and the stuff that you're living with and the drinking and the domestic issues are not taking its effect on your children and your spouses. You know, it's very important to work on your stuff, but please make sure you are, you know, open up to your spouses and your, you know, maybe not your children, depending on how old they are, because they might not be old enough to understand. But, you know, don't think for one minute that that trauma is not bleeding over to them. Um, One of my biggest fears, you know, about writing the book and sharing my stories and, you know, talking to my wife about all the things that I experienced is, you know, I thought, man, she's going to hear all these stories and look at me different. She's going to think I'm, you know, some monster. She's going to think this. She's going to think that you know what, don't put words in their mouth or put your feelings on them that, oh, they're going to feel a certain way. Let them feel the way they're going to feel. And you know what, I was shocked. Then my wife is like, you know what, you had to do what you had to do. You had to do what you had to do on the street. You had to do what you did as a surgeon, a cop, a you know, whatever your job is. You had to do what you had to do to get home to me safely in your home. And Once I understood that and came to grips with it, it was, you know what, I sat back and I thanked my wife for always being there for me. And you know what, once we had that conversation, things have been even better. So give your family the opportunity to help you. Don't put words in their mouth. Let them process what they need to process. And, you know, make sure while you're working on yourself as well, Make sure that your family is working on themselves. Go through marriage counseling, family therapy, whatever needs to happen. You know, do not let them be a statistic because all this stuff will weigh on them just as much as it weighs on you. Absolutely. And uh, if your wife is listening to this, Chris, I just want to say to her that I really appreciate all she did to take care of one of my brothers. And I appreciate that she is now in a better place as well, taking care of herself. That's great to hear, brother. Absolutely. Um, listen, Absolutely. Chris, I could talk to you for hours. I mean, let's let's be honest. I mean, I could, <laughs> I, could, I, could I could talk to you for a long time. I know you're a busy man and I don't want to take up a bunch of your time. So, Chris, I, I guess one thing I want to end off on is this. Ultimately, there is a strong message that comes out of the book. And if you had one message, one thing that people need to take away, what would it be? I think honestly, it is, you know, just like um, that, my favorite line, you know, it's okay to not be okay. And if you've survived any trauma whatsoever, whether your job, sexual assault, childhood abuse, like it doesn't even matter. It could be any job, any trauma, any, a car wreck. I mean, who knows? It is okay to not be okay. And it takes a stronger person to ask for help than it does to not ask for help and end up being at a funeral. So give yourself the grace, reach out for help, live that best life you can each and every day. And the sky's the limit as long as you allow yourself to take that chance, be vulnerable, and just live your best life. Perfectly said. Perfectly said. Chris, it's been a real pleasure to speak with you. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate, again, that you've opened yourself up to being vulnerable. I love the fact that you, you talk about so many things in the book from being a police officer to deploying and serving on the battlefields to the battles that you had to deal with at home to coming back and working and dealing with leadership issues. There being moral injury, there being administrative trauma. I mean, you sir have definitely walked the shit and you've made your way through it. And you've come out on the other side for people to take note of and look and admire and go, hey, there's a way I can do this too. There's a way that I can follow the steps of this man. Chris, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. My name is Larry Payton. I have your six. 
please have more. Don't go away. There's so much left to do, so many things I wanna say, and I sing Don't make the change. If it rains every single day, I'll fight to blow it all away.